For some organisms, like a dog, a cat, or a chameleon, it's obvious that they're animals. But what about other living things that are not as obvious, like a starfish or a sponge? How do we know what is an animal and what is not? Well, there are characteristics that animals have. They're eukaryotic heterotrophs, so they acquire energy by consuming other organisms. Most animals are also able to move, and animals in general display locomotion at least at some stage of their life cycle. Animals are also multicellular and have cells that carry out specialized functions. In addition to these characteristics, another characteristic of animals is that most, though certainly not all, reproduce sexually. Similar to last week's lab, in this week's lab you'll be learning about invertebrates. The invertebrates we covered last week belong to the phyla mollusca and arthropoda. These animals are protostomes. In this week's lab, you'll be learning about six other phyla of invertebrates, Porifera, Cnidaria, Platyhelminthes, Nematoda, Rotifera, and Annelida. This simplified phylogenetic tree provides additional details about the phyla of animals that you'll be learning about in this week's lab. As you can see, sponges lack tissues or organs, but all other animals possess tissues and organs, though not all of them have three germ layers. Cnidarians are diploblastic, they only have tissues derived from two germ layers, the ectoderm and the endoderm. Additionally, they're radially symmetrical. The rest of the animals, including rotifers, which are not shown here, are triploblastic and have bilateral symmetry. Recall that radial symmetry describes animals that have no distinct anterior or posterior end and for which it is possible to make multiple slices passing through the center, which all divide the organism into identical pieces. Bilaterally symmetrical organisms, on the other hand, have right and left sides that are mirror images. There are also animals that lack any symmetry, and this is the case for most sponges. But before we look at the defining characteristics of specific phyla, it's important to define what it means to be an invertebrate. An invertebrate is simply an animal that lacks a backbone or spinal column. Invertebrates are the largest group of animals. In fact, approximately 95% of all animals are invertebrates. Invertebrates are not only the largest group of animals, they're also the most diverse. Although the invertebrate grouping has a convenient and easy to apply definition, the lack of a backbone, the invertebrates are not a monophyletic group. In fact, there's actually one large group of invertebrates that are durostomes, like the vertebrates. This group is Echinodermata, and it includes sea stars, sea urchins, and sand dollars. This phylum of animals shows the same back-to-front gut development as the vertebrates and represents the chordate's closest relatives. Sponges are the simplest animals because they lack tissues and organs. In addition to lacking specialized tissues or organs, sponges are also unable to move as adults, they're sessile. However, they produce free-swimming larvae that allow them to disperse to new locations. Despite their simplicity, sponges are very effective at feeding. Although they're basically a tube with pores, they can strain food particles from water. These particles include bacteria, algae, and organic matter. Although sponges lack true tissues, they have different cell types. These include epidermal cells that cover the outside of the sponge, color cells, which are also known as quanocytes, and amoebocytes, which are located as individual cells between the epidermal cells and the color cells. The color cells have cilia and flagella, and as water enters the pores of the sponge, the beating of the flagella of the color cells creates a current that carries the water upward and out through the opening at the top of the sponge. As water passes by these cells, they absorb dissolved microorganisms through a process that's known as phagocytosis. The amoeboid cells, which are located between the color and epidermal cells, absorb and transport food to other cells of the sponge. Although not shown here, the region between the epidermal cells and the color cells contains a gel with spicules that stiffen the body of the sponge. Sponges are hermaphrodites. Each individual can produce both eggs and sperm, but they don't produce them at the same time. Sponges that are acting as males release a cloud of sperm that swim to other sponges which are acting as females, and they fertilize the eggs. The eggs develop into larvae that are released from the sponge and drift for a few days before settling on a new location like a rock and growing into a sessile sponge. 
Sponges are also able to reproduce asexually from buds that break off, settle to the bottom, and grow into new sponges. Another group of invertebrates are the cnidarians, and these include the sea anemones, the corals, and the jellyfish. This phylum includes about 11,000 species, and the animals, which all have defined tissues and radial symmetry, are generally simpler than bilaterally symmetrical invertebrates. There are two types of cnidarian bodies, a sessile polyp and a free-floating medusa. In some species, individuals spend part of their life cycle as a polyp and part as a medusa. But there are species like corals and sea anemones that exist only as polyps. Cnidarians are carnivores. They consume a wide variety of organisms, ranging from things like protists to fish. Recall that cnidarians are diploblastic. They only have tissues derived from the ectoderm and the endoderm. So their bodies consist of an outer layer, the epidermis, and an inner gastrodermis that surrounds the gastrovascular cavity. Between these cavities, there is a gel-like substance known as mesoglia that provides structure to the organism. To capture food, cnidarians use tentacles located around their opening, which functions like both a mouth and an anus. These tentacles have specialized cells known as cnidoses. These are basically stinging cells. The cells have a trigger on the outside. When something touches the trigger, a thread containing barbs is propelled to the outside where it can penetrate prey and inject toxins. Cnidarians can reproduce both sexually and asexually. This example shows the life cycle of a hydrozoan. As you can see, asexual reproduction happens through budding of the polyp, while sexual reproduction involves the release of gametes during the medusa stage of the life cycle. The cycle that results from sexual reproduction then develops into a polyp. Invertebrate animals also include flatworms, roundworms, and segmented worms. As you can see from this phylogenetic tree, these phyla are not a monophyletic group. In fact, roundworms are thought to be more closely related to arthropods than to flatworms or segmented worms. The phylum Platyhelminthes, or the flatworms, includes more than 20,000 species. Some of these are parasites like the flukes and the tapeworms, but this phylum also includes free-living aquatic creatures. Flatworms have a well-defined head and tail region with clusters of light-sensitive cells or eye spots. Although many flatworms have a digestive system, free-living flatworms have a gut with a single opening, and that requires them to consume food and eliminate undigested food from the same opening. Tapeworms, on the other hand, completely lack a digestive system. The parasitic worms utilize nutrients from their hosts by absorbing them right through their body wall. Most flatworms are hermaphroditic, producing both male and female gametes, and they engage in both sexual and asexual reproduction. Flatworms are acylomates. They lack a true body cavity. Instead, they have an endoderm-lined cavity where digestion occurs. A very well-known free-living flatworm is the planarian. Planarians have a retracting pharynx, which is used both for ingesting food and for releasing waste. But waste is also collected in cells near the surface of the body, which are known as flame cells, and the waste is then excreted through excretory pores. Although they're very simple animals, planarians have a rudimentary brain and a nervous system. They also have eye spots, which are used for detecting light. A remarkable characteristic of planarians is their ability for regeneration. The round worms, like the flatworms and the segmented worms, are protostomes with defined tissues, but round worms grow by molting. Most round worms reproduce sexually, and some species can produce more than 200,000 eggs per day. In fact, estimates suggest that round worms are the most abundant animals on Earth. Some soil-dwelling roundworms, called nematodes, live in the roots of plants, causing damage or even death of the plant. About 15,000 species of roundworms are parasites of vertebrate animals, and roundworms are responsible for a large number of human diseases. One of these diseases is elephantiasis, in which tiny roundworms, which are transmitted by the bite of a mosquito, block the lymph ducts so that fluid accumulates in the limbs or scrotum causing severe swelling. These parasitic roundworms occur in India, Africa, South Asia, and tropical America. Unlike flatworms, roundworms are pseudocelomates. They have a body cavity that is partially lined with mesoderm. 
They also have a complete digestive system with a separate mouth and anus. Segmented worms are easy to recognize because grooves running around their bodies mark the divisions between segments. Like flatworms and roundworms, segmented worms are protostomes. Segmented worms include marine polychaetes, earthworms, leeches, and tube worms. Segmented worms are coelomates. They have a body cavity that is completely lined with mesoderm. Internally, septa or dividing walls that are made of mesodermal tissue are located between the segments. Like roundworms, segmented worms have a complete digestive system consisting of a single tube with a separate mouth and anus. In this week's lab, you'll be learning about the function of several components of this body tube in earthworms, which are bulk feeders. Earthworms burrow into soil, and as they do, they consume particles of soil and organic material. This material is digested as it passes through the worm's one-way gut, and the fecal material along with the inorganic part of the soil is excreted as feces, which are known as castings. The digestion of the soil by the earthworms creates a more uniform mixture of nutrients, and it actually speeds up the breakdown of organic material in soil, and that makes the nutrients more readily available for plants. And for that reason, earthworms are economically important. Exteriorly, each segment contains bristles, known as CT, which aid in locomotion. Earthworms have a closed circulatory system with five hearts. They also possess a simple brain and segmental nerves that allow control of separate body segments. As you can see from this diagram, earthworms possess both male and female reproductive organs, so they are hermaphrodites. Earthworms usually reproduce sexually, and the clitellum plays an important role in sexual reproduction. However, they're also able to reproduce through a process known as parthenogenesis, which is a type of sexual reproduction in which embryos develop from unfertilized eggs. The last group of invertebrates that we'll be covering this week are the rotifers. Take a look at the following video to learn about these mysterious organisms.